to run. Yes, and welcome back, folks, to Call Susa Suzuki for July 15th. I'm Donald Glenn, the producer of JD Dr. Consultants at Live.com, and I have the most excellent uh, people on the show here. Uh, of course, we have James Betcher, the most dangerous mind in America, with his six bad books, and Scott, who's written a an outstanding book that covers everything that happened back when with the Epstein and others uh, about the Silla game situation and terrorist financing. He was right there. These guys have first had experience. Where are you going to get that anywhere else? So carry on. I think it's Scott. Scott, we're continuing with your assessment of the critique that a war, a conventional war against Iran is impossible. This situation, the ge geography, the military alliances and so forth. Please yeah, continue. I think I think the evolution of the structure of the military alliances is a very key component because we have earned the disrespect and the distrust of the world based on our cannibalization and destruction of the world. That just doesn't happen. It happens as a result of our actions. And our actions have been 20 years of the great false flag event of 9-11 where we pretended we were hit by guys flying 757s doing impossible aerodynamic stunts uh, into the Pentagon, into the Twin Towers, which have been scientifically disproven. Uh, besides the collateral damage of killing how many Americans with cancer and radiation, uh, you know, the, the American people have woken up and you do have people like architects and engineers and yourself, Jim, and Barbara Honiger and others who are, are processing and bringing that information. But 9-11 was the great kickoff of this football game from hell. And uh, I was at the Pentagon the next day and there was no plane, there was no plane parts, there was no luggage, there was no tail section, there was no engines, there was no skidding in the grass, which would have happened if a 757 came down and crashed into the Pentagon. Of course it cannot because the 757 can't fly at that uh, low altitude and that speed. It's not structurally designed for that. But uh, I was there at the Pentagon. So uh, the 9-11 kickoff led us into this seven countries in five years, Wesley Clark was talking about, and we did it. We went into Libya, we went into Ukraine, we went, went into Syria, besides Iraq and Afghanistan, and now we're trying to go in and push out Syria. And I think the world has woken up and said no. Turkey is saying no. The, the removal of Turkey from NATO, and I think it's going to adopt more of a neutral Switzerland point of view. I've said that before. That's the best state you can be in, is to be a neutral party, a neutral country. And Russia would, would welcome that. And I think Europe would welcome that, and Turkey would, because they wouldn't be you know, assigned to anyone. And they are sort of the middle straits, the, the bridge into Europe. But they're not going to allow a U.S. invasion. They're not going to allow an Iraq 2.0. Right. Iraq is not going to allow it. Iraq would shoot American planes out of the sky if we flew into Iran, I think. I think Russia would give S-500 missile series to Iran and help them shoot American planes out of the sky. I think you would have power grids going down in Idaho and California and Florida the moment we started pulling power grids out of Iran and doing cyber operations there. I think Russia and China would participate in that because I don't think anyone, any nation is going to allow us to knock over the last great power in Central Asia and claim ownership of the, as Admiral Mackinder said, uh, you know, the homeland, the, 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 the heartland. So um, Iran is not going to fall. And if we try and go in and do it, I think we're going to collapse ourselves, and uh, it's going to be quickened by uh, Russia and China and uh, and other nations uh, standing up against it. I think we're about to witness a major polar uh, paradigmatic shift in political powers because because of all these shenanigans we've done. I've ho I'm hopeful and prayerful that Trump is smart enough to realize this that. You cannot get up on a podium and say, we're the greatest country on earth, we're the most powerful nation on earth, and no one's going to tell us what to do, and no law applies to us. We're above the law. We can do anything we want to any nation any time we want. Well, that is a recipe for the fall of Babel. That is a recipe for right. God coming down and smashing this country. And uh, the moral insanity, which we've brewed in our own culture for 40, 50 years, certainly seems to be 
a tip off of that with the domestic homosexuality and lesbianism and transgenderism and abortion and all of these things which we are uh, we are, uh, you know, lobotomizing ourselves to besides the, the, uh, the, uh, the open border and the fracturization and the, and the divides that we see, we're in a very, uh, uh, weakened and schizophrenic and, and, uh, uh fragile stent state domestically. So if Trump goes in and allows the John Bolton and the other sociopaths, uh, to, to trigger a Gulf of Tonkin, uh, you're going to see, uh, all of these countries stand against us. You're going to see Iran, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Iraq. You're going to see all of them side with Iran because they know they would be the next in the domino effect. So uh, it's all fun and games, as I said, with these military planners and thinkers and these old men smoking cigarettes and going out in the Quonson hut and saying, hey, let's, let's imagine a bloody nose operation. Well, it doesn't exist in a vacuum because when you start doing uh, false flag attacks, bloody nose operations, cyber attacks, uh, limited warfare, it's going to come back and hit you in the United States. And I, I think that's a very dangerous precedent for us to be uh, putting Trump on because if he starts going down that path, he could very quickly recognize multiple ships and planes of, of the United States and perhaps the entire base of Qatar. Let's, let's not uh, take Qatar off the mat. All Iran would need to do is focus its entire elimination strategy on Qatar, and the United States is done in the Middle East because we can't do a ma massive naval armada and uh, invade Iran. They can shut down the Gulf. Uh, Israel could be evaporated, uh, and, and the rest of the countries would, would look supportive towards that. So Qatar and our military forces that may think that they're a hop, skip, and a jump away from Iran, uh, the, the moment they start to get really bloody and serious, I think, is the moment you, that entire base would be under siege, would be under all kinds of attack, and you would also have Americans being targeted uh, throughout that whole area. And you'd see Americans on TV being uh, killed in gruesome ways, and uh, it would be done most likely, you know, by Mossad, but they would be getting killed and they would be, uh, uh, you, you'd have the American public terrorized like never before, and they would blame it entirely on Trump. Jim? I think you get it. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so would you say, Scott, that uh, what happened after 9-11 was us going into seven countries in five years was not a smashing success, it was just a smash which smashed us. Uh, and we're, we have 80, well, in, in 80 countries, we have 800 bases in 80 countries. We're so spread out, we're so weak that uh, any place could be hit pretty hard and even suffer pretty bit. bit. We have some Brian stories. before the fall. We have some stories that respond to those issues. House votes to end war with Iraq, prevent war with Iran. The right. Freedom Committee of National Legislation applauded today's House votes repealing the 2002 authorization for use of military force against Saddam Hussein's Iraq and preventing a new unauthorized war with Iran. This landmark pair of victories signals a turning point in the congressional tide away from war and toward the path of peace, said Diane Randall, FCNL Executive Secretary. Our Quaker faith tells us war is never the answer. It is becoming increasingly clear that both the American people and their elected representatives agree. Voting 242 to 180 in the House adopted Barbara Lee's amendment to repeal the 2002 authorization for the use of force. The 17-year-old law solely authorized war against Iraq. Both the Trump and Obama administrations hold that for the 2002 uh, authorization for the use of military forces not authorize activities that are not already covered by the 2001 passed after the 9-11 attacks. In addition, the House approved 251 to 170 of bipartisan amendments sponsored by Representatives Roy Kohana and Matt Gatz to prohibit spending on military action against Iran unless such action has been specifically authorized by Congress or in the event of a national emergency created by an attack upon the United States. The 2002 AUMF is an unnecessary and redundant law, yet keeping it on the books leaves it vulnerable to abuse from the executive branch, explained Heather Brandon Smith, FCNL's legislative director for militarism and human rights. Repealing a 2002 AUMF protects against this or any future president exploiting it to justify 
unforeseen or unauthorized new wars. Watch this. Most U.S. vets think Middle East regime change wars weren't worth fighting. U.S. veterans are just as war-weary as the general public, according to a recent poll which found nearly two-thirds believe the war in Iraq was not worth fighting, and more than half think the same about Afghanistan and Syria. Veterans who served in either Iraq or Afghanistan are no more supportive of those engagements than those who did not serve in those wars, Pew Research Center's report published one day observed, confirming a trend of war fatigue that other pollsters have noted. Vets were slightly more likely than their civilian peers to think the Iraq war had been a bust, considering the cost versus the benefits to the U.S., with 64% declaring it had not been worthwhile. While the Iraq war ended in 2011, it was reanimated zombie-like not long after its troops were deployed to fight the Islamic State. Afghanistan got marginally more favorable reviews, though 58% of vets still believe the longest war in U.S. history has been pointless. Their responses mirror those of civilians surveyed by Pew. President Trump recently clamped down on the amount of data released by the Pentagon regarding the conflict, as the Taliban has greatly, gradually retaken over half of the country's territory. The mounting disdain for regime change wars extended to Syria, where the U.S. intervened in 2014 and still remains, despite the promises of Trump to pull out. 55% of vets said the Syrian campaign wasn't worth it. 58% of their civilian counterparts agreed. While the U.S. never officially declared war on Syria, it sent upward of 2,000 soldiers there and built a network of outposts that only became widespread when Trump announced the ill-fated pullout. While the surveyed vets' opinions remained mostly constant no matter when and how long they'd served, the divide between political parties was sharp with fully three times as many Republican vets, 45%, as Democrats, believing the Iraq war was a worthwhile endeavor. Only twice as many Republicans, 46%, supported the war in Afghanistan as Democrats, and a little over twice as many Republicans, 54%, believed the Syrian campaign had been worth it. A plurality of vets of both parties, however, approved of Trump's performance as commander-in-chief, though slightly less than half believe his policies have made the military stronger, a more positive view of the president than that held by the general public. With a total cost for the war on terror approaching six trillion, nearly two decades of constant war has taken its toll on the American military. By the end of 2019, soldiers will be enlisting who were not even born when the war in Afghanistan began. Already earlier this year, a heartwarming story about a father and daughter reunited while deployed to Iraq at the same time epitomized the futility of endless war. As for terror, it appears to be winning. A report last year found the number of Islamic militants operating worldwide had quadrupled since 9-11. Scott. Hmm. Wow. Well, Jim, anyone who knows you and I uh, knows we're not pacifists, but we're also uh, not in support of these endless wars. And I would certainly uh, put my name on the side of the ledger when doing a poll like this to say I think the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war are completely wastes and frauds and have destroyed the American character, the American reputation, the American treasury to, uh, to an unprecedented level. It was a tremendous act of treason. Uh, I joined the military because I believed the lie of 9-11 and I didn't discover until I was in prison after I was in a position in an incubator in an in a island of misfit toys. I was not, it was not until I was there that the antibiotic of truth, and the quiet of solitude, and in the prison environment where all of this sort of came to me almost on a monastic level, right? I'm in a monastery minus the big robe, and I'm thinking and processing, and men are bringing me work and, and uh, articles and books, and I see the world go from black and white to color, and I see that 9-11 is scientifically and physically impossible, and that all of the wars that were metastasized from 9-11 are frauds and fake and, and have been political designs for the neoconservative Zionist agenda of turning the world into Walmart, Mar Walmart and Starbucks. And of course, Netanyahu expanding his own territory in the Likud party and make the Greater Israel Project and beat out these little 
brown monkeys, as they call them, from the uh, indigenous lands and hills. And they've been doing that in Syria and Lebanon and the Golan Heights. And uh, now they're, they're trying to, they've done it in Iraq and they're trying to do it in, in Iran. And Saudi Arabia has been financing this. I saw that up close and personal. That was my job at U.S. Central Command was doing all of the terrorist financing operations. I know exactly where the money was coming from. And uh, the American government, the American military, and the uh, Joint Operations Center at U.S. Central Command and, and Special Operations Command, they're all complicit in a fantastic fraud. And it, I've said it before, the people that should be prosecuted for the 9-11 crime, first and foremost, should be the military at the Pentagon and the different military posts in Washington, D.C. and New York uh, that knew this was a fraud, that stuck their head out the Pentagon and saw there was no plane parts at the Pentagon and knew that there was no plane attack there, knew that there was a, a nuclear event at uh, uh, the Twin Towers. The American military swore an oath to the people of this country to defend it against foreign enemies and domestic enemies. And every military person that did not do or say anything about 9-11 on that day is a traitor. It is not worthy of wearing the uniform. It should not be considered a, a military person. They should be stripped of everything, including their pension, because they allow, they enable, they aided and abetted the greatest crime upon the American people by covering up, by enabling 9-11. And this 9-11 warmongering, drunken, Nazi Gestapo Hitlerian parade that has been going throughout the world ever since, uh, they are responsible for I understand the, 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 the faggoty dual citizen Zionists and the Dick Cheney and, and uh, the retard Bush and, and uh, Rumsfeld the atheist and Dick Myers. I debriefed Myers and Rumsfeld. I still got a video of it. But I went into the fight and, and I, I thought it was real and it was all a lie. So all, all of this stuff that we've done has cost us uh, immeasurably. It's cost us, it's damaged us. The thing that I see with Trump he, he likes the military, he parades the military, he glorifies the military. However, it's a different thing when the military uh, adventurism becomes your greatest uh, liability. It becomes your most odious, ugliest quality. And there's nothing, uh, there's nothing noble or heroic about American military intervention in Libya. There's nothing heroic there. There's nothing heroic about Amer American intervention in Syria. There's nothing heroic there. We have aided and abetted Wahhabi Salafi terrorists from Saudi Arabia and Qatar to overthrow the greatest jewel of Africa, which was Libya. And we've tried to do the same thing with uh, Syria. Senator Dick Black has gone over to Syria. Tulsi Gabbard's gone over to Syria and, and seen the truth and said, no, this is all a lie. Uh, and, and Trump had better get on their boat and get off of the Bolton and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, 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 Pompeo. Pompeo, thank you for Pompeo the Hutt. Get off their boat, and or else he's going to be on a sinking ship because the American people are going to tolerate it. And the, the, the last thing is diplomacy is the greatest psychological operation because diplomacy is about establishing relationships through the tone of your words and the light in your eyes and the magnetism in your heart and the attractiveness of your entire being. being. That is the art and skill of diplomacy that is very, very persuasive and that stops wars from ever being considered. And it requires natural diplomats, not the ugly, offensive fools like John Bolton, who has nothing attractive about him, nothing charismatic, nothing persuasive. He's all about bullying and pressuring. That loses. He's been trying to do that to people at the United Nations, threatening their children in New York if they didn't abandon their original position in, in the nine, in the in the original Iraq war. That's John Bolton. There, there's nothing good about that. And that's where Trump is hobbling himself. He's cutting his own Achilles heel by allowing these people. Now, I hope and pray he's got strategies. I always wanted to, to advance him. I think what he did in North Korea was a brilliant geopolitical operation. And perhaps he needs to take a page from that book. And when the North Koreans said, Mr. President, we want to have peace. We want to make Kim Jong-un your new adopted little Korean nephew. Look at his eyes. Look how lovely he looks to you. He admires you, Mr. President, but he's going to be pissed off and throw Chinese stars at your face if you bring that piece of garbage Bolton and Pompeo into the room. 
So don't do it. And he didn't do it. He walked into North Korea, and I think you heard a roar of applause in North Korea. I would love to see the North Korean media uh, uh, about that moment, about the American president, about healing in our time. He needs to declare the end of the Korean War today. He needs to say the Korean War is over. We are on a new era of peace. That will off-balance China. It will also give hope and perhaps some maneuverability in the Iran situation. And, uh, you know, Russia needs to come in and help the Iranian-American uh, liaison, and perhaps Turkey can too. But now is the age of diplomacy because our war machine has run out of gas. And if we try and uh, grind it further, we're going to break the entire engine of America. Jim? Why? Yeah. yeah. Can I bring up one quick point of order uh, about the Pentagon and other things on 9-11 and the military, you blaming the military. Well, what percentage of the military uh, stood up and said uh, it didn't happen this way? Well, what percentage of those people? I'd say close to zero percent. That means the entire military has been responsible for everything. Why? Because they're so brainwashed. I mean, say 58 percent of uh, John, the military... ignoring the chain of command and the role of rank right. and everything else. It's right. an authoritarian organization and structure. You don't have political dissidents in the military. They're court That's right. That's right. So. They, so yeah. They are not responsible at all. This was a political operative thing. And That's so right. In a nice position to observe that there was no evidence of any plane having crashed or CNN right. and best correspondent Jamie McIntyre can because yeah. he reported from his own close-up inspection there was no sign of a large plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. He was right. speaking the truth. And from that point on, the American media has gone into the gutter. That's right. It has. Yep. That's where we're at now. Meanwhile, Barack and Michelle Obama silenced torpedoes Biden's campaign. The recent political dust up between 2020 hopefuls Joe Biden and Kamala Harris during the first Democratic debate reminded voters that Democrats, not Republicans, were the party of slavery, Jim Crow laws, fought against civil rights, and occupied the hallowed halls of Congress as segregationists. Former Vice President Creepy Joe Biden was their friend and voted in lockstep with racists and segregationists. Biden went on the record applauding his deep personal friendships and admiration for South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, North Carolina Senator Jesse Holmes, Senator John Stennis, Senator James Eastland, and then Senator Herman Talmadge. Biden has also gone so far as to praise the infamous Alabama segregationist Governor George Wallace. All of these men have been divisive racial figures, segregationists, some were even aligned with the Ku Klux Klan. Biden's comments on the campaign trail have drawn anger from fellow party members and presidential candidates like Senator Kamala Harris, who took Biden to task in the first Democratic debate over the busing of minority students to integrate San Francisco's public schools. I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground, Senator Harris reportedly said, but I also believe in it's personal and it was hurtful here you talk about the reputation of two United States senators who built their reputation and career on the segregation of race in this country. Biden stood firmly and voted against desegregation policies such as busing and voted to withhold federal funds from poor women seeking abortions. His positions run contrary to the current DNC platform. His polling numbers have plummeted as the truth about his past surfaces. As the racial issues begin to curtail his presidential aspirations, Biden did what Democrats do when under fire. He issued a half-hearted apology, claimed his remarks were misinterpreted, tried to rewrite a 40-year narrative of repeatedly praising racists and KKK members. Former First Lady Michelle Obama was asked pointed questions about Biden's remarks and his affiliation with known racists during the Essence Festival held in New Orleans. I've been doing this rodeo far too long with no comment, the former first lady reportedly said. Brock and I are going to support whoever wins the primary. Our primary focus is letting the primary process play out. It's like trying to figure out who's going to win the World Series on the first of seven games. That's where we are right now. It's so early and things will change. Michelle Obama's refusal to answer questions or endorse a candidate she knew well for more than eight years was stunning. Not only did she not comment, 
but she did not defend him against claims of racism either. The Obamas appear caught in a firestorm after embracing the pro-segregationists and spending eight years long with the White House together. Questions continue to surface as to why Biden was told to stand down in 2016 and clear the field for Hillary to run. Did the former first family grow to understand the depth of Biden's segregationist leanings and self-proclaimed friendship with known racists? The Obama's lack of endorsement or defense of their friend hasn't gone unnoticed. The silence was initially stayed off by Biden claiming he wanted to make it on his own. Many have wondered aloud if that was fake propaganda. Until recently, liberal pundits in the make news media touted Biden as the only candidate able to win against Trump in 2020. That narrative has been dismantled now, leaving Democrats without direction. Lack of endorsement and deafening silence by the Obamas hit the listless Biden campaign like a two-ton torpedo. In a recent Quinnipiac poll, Biden's significant lead plummeted by upwards of 10 points. The survey showed him in a statistical dead heat with Senator Harris and Harris leads among women and far-left liberals. The leader of the free world with a tweet can start a war, can crush an economy, can change the future of our children, Michelle Obama said. It is a real job that requires deep seriousness and focus. Somebody who has had enough understanding of history so you don't repeat what hasn't worked. Interesting, she did not mention creepy Joe Biden as a person prepared to take over that mantle. Meanwhile, Eric Swalwell is the first Democrat to drop out of the 2020 race. The Washington Free Beacon has compiled a video montage that could well be titled Ode to the Circular Firing Squad, as it reported the first of the Democratic presidential hopefuls to bow out, California Congressman Eric Swalwell. Speaking in Berlin in April, former President Barack Obama invoked that phrase when he gave a rallying call to progressives speaking about so-called infighting. Obama warned that party in infighting creates a circular firing squad where you start shooting at your allies because one of them is strained from purity on the issues. Scott. Yep. Well, uh, Eric Swalwell most likely has taken into very serious consideration the revelations of Shell Game, which I gave to him when I saw him at the Pete's Coffee in Danville wearing his uh, Irish, uh, uh, his Irish uh, rugby shirt. He doesn't look like anybody who plays rugby, of course, but he got a little bit of a tackling from me. And uh, I think that uh, he, he, he's certainly going to be brought in uh, to account. So is uh, Spears of San Francisco and uh, all of these other Democrats, Donna Shalala, <clears throat> her nephew, David Shalala, who's part of the deep state Clinton operation against me. Uh, I think the Epoch Times is another valuable source of truth, Jim, in, in bringing in a lot of this analysis because the Epoch Times has done a wonderful piece on the entire Spygate and uh, all of the multiple intelligence agencies from Britain and Australia and and uh, uh, in, in trapping Papadopoulos and all these other people. Uh, so we're, we're witnessing an implosion of uh, the deep state and the Obama era and all of the part parties at uh, the CIA, John Brennan, uh, Eric Holder, Lanny Brewer, Department of Justice, uh, they're all going to be held to account. And that's, gonna, that's going to have an effect on Biden, of course, because he was there. He was part of this operation. He was part of this conspiracy and this scandal. Jim, I mean, Biden was uh, uh, already given public remarks about how he shut down an investigation into a company in Ukraine that his son was affiliated with. So there's blatant government corruption. Uh, and, and Ukraine is turned back to Russia that's going to increasingly be bonded and strengthened. Putin is very smart. Putin is going to bring Ukraine back into its fold, and it's going to abandon Europe because they see Europe as just a bunch of chicken little schizophrenics who uh, you know, don't have any moral compass whatsoever. And it's very sad to say, but that's the nature of the beast. That's why the former Soviet bloc countries are the only hope for a revitalized Christian culture in Europe. France and Spain and Germany uh, are going to go into civil war. Uh, Germany will peel off into uh, segregated parts, as will Scotland and certain parts of Scandinavia. But I, I see them all going back towards the cold, uh, cold weather quarter and the cold uh, uh, alliances of Russia, rather than the metrosexual political correctness of 
of uh, the United Kingdom. That's coming out every day. The United Kingdom is an enemy of Donald Trump. It's the enemy of the truth. It's participant in the deep state. Uh, Joe Biden was a, as a key figure in all that. So uh, I think we're going to witness to Joe Biden is a complete incompetent. He's a drunk. I've, I've known friends of mine of the Bush administration that were in Iraq that were female and attractive. And he, you know, was stinking a whiskey and trying to slobber and kiss them and all this. And he's got uh, pedophile inclinations. That's the other thing that could be very revealing about Joe Biden is his pedophi pedophile impulses. Who knows how many Epstein uh, entourages he may have entertained. But uh, uh, the, the other candidates, of course, next to Biden are complete uh, fools and violent uh, reparations, racists. And, uh, you know, Kamala Harris and Jesse Smollett, her nephew, trying to trigger a race war and a homosexual uh, you know, anti-hate campaign by, by this false, uh, this false act of pretending you're being abused. I mean, all of the media is losing ground. All of them, MSNBC, CNN, all of them have lost. Tucker Carlson is the only one with any ounce of integrity. Uh, some of the other Fox people do, but they're, they're really on thin ice because they're, they're too, they're too militaristic too. They're too empire yeah. molded. So I think we're, we're going to witness the entire Democratic platform fall apart unless they're smart enough to bring Tulsi Gabbard in. And I'll keep that dark horse in my pocket because if Tulsi Gabbard arose to run against Trump and brand, was branded the peace candidate and Trump got us into a fight and became the war candidate, he'd lose. He'd lose because people don't care about the border or domestic policies. Hell, they'll get their Winchesters and govern, govern their own towns. Uh, but they do care about war because it threatens their kids and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren. And they they voted Trump to end the wars. So if he doesn't do it, and Tulsi Gabbard promises to, they'll vote for her. I don't think they're that smart. I think they're going to push Tulsi out, and then miraculously, you'll see Tulsi Gabbard join the the Trump administration. Jim, fascinating stuff. Yeah, yeah she's Robert. the greatest. She's the best. I think. Meanwhile, there's a, a bizarre new view being circulated. They're trying to keep the Russian hacking meme alive. And therefore, they're suggesting the very idea that Seth Rich had downloaded the DNC files directly at the server is being characterized as a Russian intel plant. In other words, a conspiracy theory from Russia. This is about as absurd as it gets. It's a, it's a desperate ploy that has no basis or foundation whatsoever. We know Seth Rich did it. He was a Bernie Sanders supporter, disillusioned at the way that Debbie Wasserman Schultz was sabotaging Bernie Sampaign and transferring 13 primaries to Hillary to guarantee she would be the, the victor. He was aided and abetted by Kim.com and he transferred the files to Julian Assange by way of Craig Murray, the UK ambassador to Uzbekistan. So how are, the, given the Mueller report, how are these very devious, bizarre uh, uh, conspiracy theorists handling it. Russian intel planted Seth Rich conspiracy theory report. Conspiracy theories that former Democratic National Committee staffer Seth Rich was murdered on the orders of 2016 presidential candidate Hillary Clinton originated with the Russian Foreign Intel Service according to a Yahoo News investigation. This is nonsense beyond belief. John Podesta, by the way, appears to have fingered Seth Rich, not Hillary herself. The SVR circulated a fake bullet and it passed off as a genuine intelligence report about Rich, who was killed in Washington, D.C. in July of 2016, in what the D.C. Police Department said was a botched robbery, but obviously was not. The document outlined the initial conspiracy theory that Rich was killed on Hillary's orders on his way to alert the FBI to corruption within the Clinton campaign. That's just fabricated. That's completely made up. That's total bullshit. Yep, the, same day, the same day the details were reproduced on the website, whatdoesitmean.com, which attributed them to Russian intelligence. To me, having a foreign intelligence agency set up one of my decedents with lies and planning false stories, to me, that's pretty outrageous. Former assistant U.S. attorney Deborah Sines who oversaw the Rich case until she retired in 2018, told Yahoo. Many other people don't think it's outrageous. I did once it became clear to me this was coming from the SVR, 
that triggered a lot of very serious questions about what do I do with this? And we know already, of course, the CIA can plant the signatures that make it look as though it came from any source. Over the next two and a half years, the Internet Research Agency, the group that conducted Russia intelligence social media misinformation operation during the 2016 election, promoted the conspiracy theories under accounts purporting to be American citizens or organization, according to Yahoo. This is just total rubbish, I got to tell you. Remember, the CEO of Google even explained, he testified to Congress, the total amount of money Russia spent trying to affect the election was $4,700, <laughs> as much as he'd spend on a, on a brunch for his executives at Google. The story gained traction among conservative outlets following WikiLeaks' release of hacked Democratic emails, hacks, which U.S. intelligence believe were also conducted by Moscow, another fake story. I mean, look, even Mueller concluded this wasn't true. As late as 2017, then White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon reportedly texted a 60 Minutes producer to say Rich's death was a contract kill, obviously, claiming Rich was a supporter of Clinton's primary rival, Senator Bernie Sanders, which was true. Fox News Hannity also promoted the theory in 2017 until Fox retracted a report that Rich had been in contact with WikiLeaks after one of its main sources backtracked on his claim, no doubt under the threat of death. Here we have the man who drew the Seth Rich conspiracy comic has been invited by the White House to attend its far-right social media Senate. That's Ben Garrison, a completely brilliant political cartoonist. Notice Kim.com who's acknowledged assisting Seth Rich in doing this is going all in with evidence. And here you have Podesta, the DNC, and Hillary who are all baffled by what, how to play their cards. Meanwhile, and this is going back a year, the family of Seth Rich has confirmed he transmitted the DNC email well, to WikiLeaks. We have been waiting a long time to hear this. The family of Seth Rich has admitted they knew what Seth did. Ed Butowski, the man who assisted them as a private investigator, came forward to say in a December 2016 conversation with his father, Joel Rich, he admitted he knew what his son did. It's shocking to know that Joel and Mary Rich kept this to themselves all this time but I cannot imagine how long it's taken them to process. I wonder what Aaron Rich is saying. Unfortunately, Joel and Mary have been brainwashed by the left so badly they've worried their son would be remembered in helping to get President Trump elected. We must pray that opening their eyes soon to their son as an American hero. Here's from the fourth year surgery resident about what happened while Seth had been shot with three gunshot wounds, entry and exit and entry taken to the OR where they performed an X-lap, found a small injury to segment three of the liver, which was packed in several small bowel injuries. He, he was uh, left in discontinuity. They didn't hook everything up with the intent to perform a washout in the morning. He didn't have any major vascular injuries. I've seen dozens of worse cases than this who survived. Nothing about his injury suggested to me he sustained a fatal wound. In the meantime, he was transferred to the ICU and transfused two units of blood. His post-surgery crit came back at about 20. He was stable, not on any press or assumed pretty routine. About eight hours after he arrived, we were swarmed with law enforcement officers. Oh. Pretty much everyone except for the attending and a few nurses was kicked out of the ICU. Following visiting hours, normally every odd hour, 1 a.m., 3 a.m., not something we do routinely. It was weird as hell. It turned out that morning we were instructed not to round on the VIP who came in last night. That's exactly what the attending said, and no one except for me and another resident had any idea who he was talking about. No one here was allowed to see Seth except for my attending when he died. No code was called. I rounded on patients literally next door but was physically blocked from checking in on him. I've never seen anything like it before. Well, I can't say 100% he was allowed to die. I don't understand why he was treated like that. Take it how you may. I'm just one low level doc. Something's fishy though, that's for sure. Meanwhile, veteran intelligent professionals for sanity, these are our best people, cyber experts stated. Forensic studies of Russian hacking into the DNC computers last year revealed that on July 5th, 2016, data was leaked not hacked, by a person with physical access to the DNC computer. 
after examining metadata from the Guccifer 2.0 July 5th, 2016 intrusion into the DNC ser server. Independent cyber investigators have concluded that an insider copied DNC data onto an external storage device. Additionally, the former Intel ops detail how the FBI neglected to perform any independent forensics on the original Guccifer 2.0 and assert that the reason the U.S. government lacks conclusive evidence of a transfer of a Russian hack to WikiLeaks is because there was no such transfer. Among those who signed on to their part is William Binney, former NSA technical director for World Geopolitical and Medical Analysis, co-finder of NASA Signals Intelligence Automation Research Center, Larry C. Johnson, who's retired from the CIA and State Department, Kirk Weber, former senior analyst at SIGINT, Automated Research Center of the NASA, and many more. Although Assange has infamously expressed interest in Rich, he's always maintained WikiLeaks will never name a source. WikiLeaks has offered a $20,000 reward for Seth Rich's murderer, however, and has retweeted articles that asserted he was their source without it providing any additional comment or contradiction. If you want to know the full story, Greg Jarrett lays it out in spades, a Russia hoax, the illicit scheme to clear Hillary Clinton and frame Donald Trump. Scott. Yeah, by the way, real quickly, uh, Michael Isikoff is on both Fox News and uh, CNN talking about the Russian connection to Seth, Seth Rich's death and saying that was just preposterous uh, that the Russia would do that. But they didn't offer any suggestion as to how Seth Rich might have died uh, other than uh, uh, it's a preposterous thing. I think what you put out here, Jim, is it. Scott? Well, any anytime you see Michael Isikoff anywhere talking, you hear yeah. CIA talking. That's the right. CIA and uh, Tom Hamburger. Uh, the, how, do you, how do you know he's lying? His lips are moving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. right. I mean, I was there. I was there. I looked into his eyes. I, I'll never forget those two hours. And I'm mad as a hornet. I'm, throw, I'm almost just pounding paper like that gorilla in the Samsonite commercial, breaking up the luggage. I was just, what the hell am I doing here? I'm looking to walls to punch, and I'm giving all this stuff. Swiss banks, terrorist financing, Brad Birkenfeld, WikiLeaks Cable, the Clinton Foundation, Saudi Arabia, and what the hell am I doing here? I'm a U.S. military officer, did this for a living. You need to get out and report this, Isakoff. And they say, Mr. Bennett, why do you think the CIA would do this? <laughs> that was it. That was all that I was ever said of CIA. And then I had two relatives had oh. their homes invaded and their computers taken a month after that meeting. So no, Isikoff is CIA. And this is the dirty yeah. CIA. This is the okay. pieces of garbage CIA. These are the trash, uh, the coward CIA. The, the real men of CIA, the real white hats that I knew and that I worked with, I think they're exposing these these cancerous gangrene infections and they're pushing them out. Uh, and, and there's, there's so much scandal. Look, th this is, this is like America has been constipated for eight years and Trump is the enema giving <laughs> to, to all of the shit that we've been building up for eight years. I'm sorry. Thank you God for that little image. But, He's, you know, Trump's inserted the rubber hose and went, <clears throat> and we're getting all sorts of stuff coming out. And yeah, it's going to, I think they need to hang Bush uh, no. Jr. too. Hell, dig up Bush Sr. and hang him like a pinata and kill him and his Again. skeletal remains. Yeah, right. This this is an affront on, on America's face as a whole, America's nation. So we're, we're going through eight years of revealing the cleansed, garbage that Obama has done, Hillary Clinton has done, John Brennan has done, the CIA has done, Eric Holder, Lanny Brewer, Seth Rich, uh, the, the, the DNC Debbie Wasserman Schultz, her brother was a lawyer at the Department of Justice or the federal courts in DC. The whole Seth Rich thing smells. Wasserman Schultz, who is the Pakistani uh, Amwan brothers who did the technology who uh, you know were, were involved with uh, potentially all sorts of dirtiness. We've got the the CIA and the in the in the Senate listening to Feinstein. I wonder why. Uh, of course, and then Jer Jared's book, The Russia Hoax, and and Jan Bongino and others, uh, they they go, do a good analysis 
of what was happening. Uh, but, you know, very few people were there. I was there with Brad Birkenfeld myself sitting at a table in a Pennsylvania prison up at a rock garden with a special forces guy, I won't mention names, going through all this stuff. And it blows your mind. It blew me out of Kansas into Oz. And I can't wait till the rain of houses comes smashing down on Acosta, on Clinton, on Holder, right. on all these people, because that's when you're going to see Brad Birkenfeld, Scott Bennett, Julian Assange, Edward Snowden lining up going, this is what we saw, this is what we did, this is where we were, and well, here's how right. all of these people are implicated. Jim? Sensational. Just Absolutely. wonderful, Scott. Outstanding. Outstanding. Meanwhile, House Democrats use a photo from the Obama administration to promote investigation into inhumane treatment at the border. Very embarrassing. House Democrats tweeted a photo from President Obama's administration to promote their investigation into inhumane treatment at the border before deleting the tweet. The Committee on Oversight and Reform announced a hearing advisory set for Wednesday titled Kids in Cages, Inhumane Treatment at the Border. The hearing will be examining this alleged inhumane treatment after members of the committee witnessed the grotesque treatment of children. The announcement was meant to be for the inhumane treatment allegedly occurring under President Trump. The tweet, however, included a photo, but there was a problem. The photo included a, 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 with a tweet was of children in cages during the Obama administration. According to Trump's 2020 presidential campaign, the photo was quickly deleted. Trump War Room, an account managed by the Trump 2020 presidential campaign, included a second tweet, which showed the specific portion of the photo included in the House Democrats tweet. There you can see it at the bottom. This is from the period of 2014 when Obama was president. Here's a very better photograph, AP fact check. 2014 photo wrongly used to hit Trump policies, Washington. Since the government acknowledged last month the Trump administration had lost track of nearly 1,500 immigrant children, debate over what that means and who is to blame has roiled Twitter. A look at partisan claims and the reality check behind the latest immigration fight, the 2014 photos. Speechless. This is not who we are as a nation, Democrat Antonio Filia Grossa, former Los Angeles mayor, now reigning for governor referring in a tweet Sunday to photos showing young-looking immigrants in steel cages. This is happening right now, and the only debate that matters is how we force our government to get these kids back to their families as fast as humanly possible. John Favreau, who is speechwriter for President Barack Obama, referring Sunday to the same photo, but they were taken during the Obama administration. Meanwhile, John King points out problems at the border didn't stop with Trump. Democrats have criticized Trump and his administration for its immigration policies, as well as the treatment of migrants at the border. King said the U.S. faced many of the same problems under Obama. This particular issue is not new, he said. This has been a problem for the U.S. trying to figure out for a long time. He then played an interview of Barack Obama with ABC's George Stephanopoulos, where Obama issued warnings to migrant families not to send their children unaccompanied to the U.S. That is five years ago this very week. That's five years ago this very week in the sense that, again, there's a current divide. The current president evokes emotions among Democrats, Sting said. A lot of progressives weren't happy with that president. President Obama, they called him a deporter in chief, but this issue has been unresolved. Different pieces of it for 20 plus years about unaccompanied children. That's a clip from five years ago this week. When, how? Meanwhile, the California governor, the is a first date to give illegals health care, and it's going to cost all of the nation because it turns out there's a clause in the federal law that all of the other 49 states have to make a contribution to California's largesse. Just imagine what happens. If half of the country were illegals, California, if its policies prevailed, they'd all get free health care at the expense of everyone else. This is a manifest absurdity and shows a complete decadence and stupidity of the Democratic Party. Scott. Well, he, he is. I mean, you're recognizing the implosion of the Democratic Party. You're recognizing a complete divorcement from the moral values of, of the United States of America. You're, you're representing uh, a, a descent into tyranny 
that started under Obama. You're, the truth doesn't matter to the Democrat propagandists or the media that embolden and support them. The truth of these photographs linked to directly to the Obama administration operations is an inconvenient fact. And the American people are, are denied that truth by the mainstream media, but that's where the alternative media comes in. That's where Trump needs to really focus on, uh, you know, obliterating Facebook and YouTube and, and uh, their whole tyrannical police powers because they represent the greatest threat to American democracy and truth that we've ever seen. They are the cover-up artists, as we've seen, they shut down my page because we did our analysis of the New Zealand shooting. And they are going to go to court and be uh, accused of aiding and abetting a crime, both in New Zealand and in America, because they purposely shut down voices of truth that exposed that this shooting did not occur in the way it was presented and people did not die by bullets that were shot out of guns in that video because that video was a complete hoax. Because of those words, because of that analysis, YouTube shut down the channel uh, of, of, of that video. That's aiding and abetting a crime. That opens up a whole new horizon of lawsuits. Laura Loomer has filed a $3 billion lawsuit. They're allegedly going to get time at the White House to talk about this. This is the new Nazi Gestapo uh, brown shirts. And it's funny, a lot of them are homosexual in the early days. Yeah. And it's most likely applying here now. The new Gestapo brown shirts that are trying to suppress truth, uh, Trump needs to go in and act on them. And I know they also had a $500 billion fine by the F FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. It's funny, Jim, because you and I were the ones who were talking about this, I think a year ago, about how the Federal Communication Commission is the agency that can go in and uh, neuter these, com these companies uh, by by restricting their licenses and finding them. It's funny that Trump is doing exactly that thing now. I wonder who's listening. Jim? Maybe he's watching our old episodes. <laughs> Love it, Scott. Meanwhile, here we have a poor principal who's trying to be honest in his dealing who says he can't claim the Holocaust is a factual historical event because he believes he's supposed to be neutral as a principal. Uh, uh, he sparks outrage by telling him, Mom, the mass slaughter of six million Jews is a belief students don't have to learn. But of course, it's a false belief. Having done a great deal of research on this myself, it turns out the International Committee of the Red Cross was keeping copious documented records about all of the inmates of the camps, their age, their sex, their religion, their ethnicity, their cause of death. In 1993, they recalibrated the total and they found that altogether, from all the camps combined, there had been 296,081 deaths, none of whom died because they were put into a gas chamber from Cyclone B. Yeah, Don's showing the photograph of the British soccer team at Auschwitz. I'll bet you didn't know. So here you got a principal who's trying to be honest and he's been lacerated. A high school principal has sparked anger after he told the mother of a pupil the Holocaust is a belief students don't have to learn. William Latson, who was the head of Spanish River High School in Boca Raton, told the parent Holocaust education is to be introduced but not forced upon individuals, as we all have the same right but not all the same beliefs. Watson was responding to a question about a Second World War, the Second World War II curriculum when he explained the controversial position according to a series of emails seen by the Palm Beach Post. The mother, who did not wish to be named, replied, the Holocaust is a factual historical event. It is not a right or a belief, as though she were a scholar, as though she somehow knew what is the truth and what is not about the Holocaust. However, the principal insisted not everyone believes the Holocaust happened. You have your thoughts, but we are a public school. Not all of our parents have the same beliefs, so they'll react differently. He very appropriately observed. My thoughts or beliefs have nothing to do with this because I'm a public servant. I have the role to be politically neutral, but support all groups in the school. He added, I can't say the Holocaust is a factual historical event because I'm not in the position to do so as a school district employee. And we also know this phrase about six million having been in dire straits began in the international press occurred 236 times prior to the Nuremberg Tribunal beginning as early as 1890. 
it has no scientific or empirical foundation at all, but is derivative of a disputed passage in Leviticus interpreted to mean that the chosen people can return to the promised land only when they're minus six million who have been consumed in the flames. But even that requires an interpolation because there was no word in the original Hebrew for six million. Well, needless to say, he's been dry roasted. Principal who tried to stay politically neutral about Holocaust is removed. I can't say the Holocaust is a factual historical event. Frankly, if it were being more candid, he'd say because it wasn't. But I'm in the position because I'm a school district employee. The comment saw off an intense backlash in South Florida with its significant Jewish population among the highest concentration of Holocaust survivors in the world. In fact, it's remarkable. Every year there are more Holocaust survivors than the year before. <laughs> signed an online petition calling for his resignation on Monday. The Palm Beach County City School District announced he'd be stripped of his position and reassigned to another job in the district, maybe as a janitor. The debate comes as memory of the Holocaust is fading and anti-Semitism is on the rise. Florida is among the states working to combat that under state law. All school districts must offer Holocaust education. In 2018, of all absurdities, a gunman who was said to have killed 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, which was another stage event where nobody died, about a 20 minute drive from Spanish River Community High School opened fire during one of these lessons, a class called History of the Holocaust. Scott, this is just embarrassingly bad, embarrassingly bad. Yep. Well, we're, we, you know, the internet is, is like Aladdin's lamp. You, you, you rub it and suddenly all sorts of smoke and, and uh, revelations and truth starts spewing out. And uh, it's, it's almost like actually a, a lamp of oxygen and clear air that's flooding up and dispelling the black smoke of lies and the, 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 the toxic uh, pungency of stupidity and, and blindness. And that's what so many on the totalitarian uh, side have been uh, pushing because they thrive on chaos and fear to maintain political power. And uh, with political come power with, comes money and riches. And with money and riches comes the satiation of their lusts and pedophilia and all sorts of evil follow that. So the political powers of suppression uh, are long on the side of lies and the black smoke of confusion, but the internet is is producing the clear air of truth that's dispelling that. And the Holocaust psychological operation, which you've done excellent work, Jim, on the on the scholarship of that, is naturally being uh, exposed and revealed as a as a psyop for what it was. So I think it's a a matter of time before Americans really begin to go. You know what? As Pachenik said, Israel is probably one of the worst enemies America could ever have, and it's time to return our attention and our dollars to our own country and our own constitution, and no one can have dual citizenship anywhere, period. Go ahead. And be in a, a government position to shape policy or make decisions, I agree completely. That's right. It, it turns out that noncompliance is kneecapping New Zealand's gun control scheme, there's a key par paragraph here. Traditionally relaxed in its approach to firearms regulation and enjoying a low crime rate because they had a relaxed attitude. They're finding no one wants to turn in their guns. It's embarrassing. It's also true in Australia, and it's going to be true right here in the USA. I move to our final series. Uh, Sandy Hook parents lose a state court appeal against Newtown over a school shooting. This was in Connecticut, where the appeals court held the school district wasn't responsible. Carl Herman has done a brilliant piece on my show trial here, right here in Dane County. You can find it on my blog. I highly recommend it. Jim yeah. Fetzer's debrief on Sandy Hook show trial, Orwellian judge violates right for jury to determine disputed facts, claims five versions of death certificate, no differences, silences to expert witnesses, proving multiple areas of forgery. This is a really brilliant article. And now Paul Craig Roberts has picked up on it. Who remembers the Sandy Hook school shootings? The official explanation given of the Sandy Hook shooting struck many people at the time as fishy. Various aspects of the story didn't seem to go together well or fit normal procedures for such a crime. Contradictory evidence was never explained and doubts based on evidence were ignored rather than answered. Now a Wisconsin state judge, Frank D. Remington, 
have renewed doubts about the Sandy Hook event. This was not Judge Revington's intention. It was the result of his summary judgment in a civil defamation lawsuit in favor of Lenny Posner against Fetzer and Mike Palachek. Fetzer accused Posner of using a fake death certificate as evidence that Noel Samuel Posner, age six, was shot and killed at Sandy Hook. You can find more. Meanwhile, we have been massively hit by Amazon.com. We now have six of our 12 books banned, and, and Don has brilliantly picked up copies of the Parkland Puzzle, how the pieces fit together, and I suppose we didn't go to the moon either. Political theater in Charlottesville, from Orlando to Dallas and beyond, and nobody died in Boston either. Don, I'm going to give you the final closing comments here. Oh, wonderful. This is, this is great here. I get the right screen on here. I can't do that. Anyway, uh, but, uh, you know, you know uh, our rights have been violated. Jim's rights have been violated for freedom of the press and other things. And we're telling the truth. These books, I have all, all six of them uh, now. Uh, and uh, these are just priceless. We're going to want to have these. These are real history. You ain't going to get nowhere else, and it's just uh, the best thing you can do. And I think this show is very good. By the way, if you missed Michael J., let me know, JD Duck Consultants. Uh, and uh, let's uh, take, uh, take on here. Uh, by the way, we're saying here that when truth is politicized, all is lost. You're seeing that right now. So uh, this it, is uh, pretty heavy times here. All, all kinds of exciting things are happening. And I think it's just about time that we have to depart from this week. And we thank you so much for. You're listening around the world. We love you all and uh, keep watching and sharing. Okay. So thank you. And we go now. Bye bye.